All right, we now welcome on to the podcast, Chris Crates. Chris, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So, Chris, I got I, I reached out to a a former player of yours, and this was um, over a decade ago. He played for you over a decade ago. Okay, just to give you a heads up. And so I said, you know, hey, Chris Cates is coming on the podcast. Um, I saw that, you know, you had worked with him and, and or played for him. What are your thoughts? And I'll be honest, I, I was, I didn't, I didn't give him a heads up or anything. I was like, I, I hope, because this was yesterday. So okay. we had, we had already had this podcast scheduled. So I was like, I hope it's not like, oh, worst coach I ever had, like <laughs> terrible guy. I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say to him. This is what his response was. He said, um, um, cause he said, oh, he said he, you were a great coach. And I said, well, why? And he said, he's just a good person, very relatable, does a good job of meeting players where they're at. And he has fire BP. <laughs> any, do you have any guess who that was? Well, if it was over 10 years ago, it had to be when I was at Florida state. Yep. That's my guess. Yep. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of guys, obviously, that I coach there. Uh, I'm going to go with – I'm just going to take a shot in the dark. Marcus Davis? That's exactly who it was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what it was. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Nice. Yeah. That was that was awesome because I was reading your bio, and, um, you know, on there it has said – because Marcus got drafted out of Florida State, and and so on there it's like, oh, Coach Marcus Davis. Like, oh, my gosh. Marcus is such a – he's a good buddy of mine. We both live in Cincinnati. So we awesome. grew up playing together. So I was like, I have to fire this text. So I thought I was like, Whew, all right, this this guy's all, this guy's a winner for sure. Um, that's funny. But I, in talking to some other people, and I, I watched one of your videos back when because you played college baseball at Louisville, mm -hmm. which is a great program. Um, talk to me about your own recruiting process as a player. I think it'll be interesting for people to to hear your own story, and then we'll get into kind of the the X's and O's of coaching and, and your own philosophy and things like that. But take me back to it when you were in high school and your own recruiting process, how did that all go down? Yeah. You know, I actually uh, didn't get a whole lot of offers out of high school. Um, and I did go to university of Louisville and that actually came about uh, during districts of my senior year. So I, I, we're talking May, 2003, and I still don't know what I'm doing for college. Uh, you were a I senior. Had, and you were a senior. Correct. I, I had a couple Juco, um, offers and just didn't nothing against your college baseball, but academically speaking, um, I had an academic scholarship that I could use towards a four-year program. Uh, it was, a uh, an award that I was, uh, a recipient of here in Tampa. And so I wanted to go to a four-year school. Um, and my, uh, first round of districts, my senior year, um, I got a call from coach at university of Louisville and said he was coming down to watch me play. Um, they needed an infielder for the next season and he came down, watched me take infield, and then called me over and said, you know, he was he was heading out. So I just assumed like I probably didn't know I was only five foot three, probably like, yeah, this guy's too small. And so I said, Well, I appreciate you coming out. Sorry if I wasted your time. And he said, you know, what do you mean? He said, That's all I need to see. He goes, I want to bring you on a visit next week. So um, so I went up there, fell in love with it. Um back then, you know, Louisville wasn't the program it is, you know, today. Um we played on a uh, converted uh, football field, old Cardinal Stadium. Um, so it was, you know, it, it was a, it was still a, a program that people knew, but it wasn't, um, you know, as successful as uh, as it's been in the last you know ten years. So went up there and, you know, fell in love with uh, with the coaching staff and, and fell in love with the city. And um, you know, it was the best decision I ever made for my career. And um, you know, now obviously Coach Mac, uh, he came in my senior year, and you know the 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 heights that he's taken that program to, um, you know, it's, it's really great to see uh, and be an alumni and, and kind of, kind of feel like I had a part in, you know, kind of building that um, with my other teammates that, that, you know, our last year we went to uh, Omaha for the first time, the first time in school history. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to, to see the program and, and, you know, to kind of reminisce on what we came from and where it's at now. So hold on. There's, there's a couple things you said there that I have to, I have to ask about the first one. I don't know if you were just exaggerating. Five foot three, correct. I'm You're five, five foot three. three. <laughs> I and, am, and you were the starting shortstop at Louisville that went to the College World Series. Correct. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> it, that's isn't that the great thing about baseball? Like I'm six three. You're five three, but yet you had a way better. You were a way better player than I was. Isn't that that's what that's what I love about baseball? It's so great. 
So the other thing I want to ask about is you said the coach came to watch you in infield and then he, he didn't even stay for the game. Correct. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. Take- I just assumed that, you know, he, he maybe didn't knew, you know, what size I was and he just thinking like, ah, oh, this guy can't play division one baseball. But uh, yeah, he's, he said it, you know, he watched me take infield and I was, I was blessed with a, uh, with a really good arm. Um, I was also our closer in high school. Um, so I think, you know, he told me with my ability to, to feel the way I could. And then my arm strength, he said, you know, there was no doubt that, uh, that they wanted me to, you know, come up there and, and see the campus and, and, you know, hopefully be a part of uh, the university of Louisville for the next season. So um, yeah, I just, I took IO and he, he said, that's all he needed to see. So after, after, you know, he told me that obviously I was a l- little bit less pressure and thinking I could just enjoy the game now and not have to worry about doing too much, um, especially on the offensive side to, to make them, um, you know, still want to to bring me up, but he left, and so I mean, I don't even remember what I did in the game, and I know we won, uh, but I don't remember what I did, you know, uh, personally. But I just knew the whole time I was thinking of the game, like, wow, like, man, that's great. I just can enjoy the game now. Wow, that's 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 a great story, man. That's a great. Story. How hard could you throw? You said you were a closer in high school. So off the mound, believe it or not, uh, I I used to get up to about ninety two, um, and then <laughs> oh uh, I actually. God. It yeah, has to be I, a record for somebody your size. <laughs> I don't know. I, I actually got to pitch a couple times in pro ball too and ran it up to like 91. And uh, I got one outing in, in college and ran it up to 89 um, straight from short. Didn't get to warm up, you know, just went straight in. And uh, it was, to finish a game, we were we were getting beat pretty good. And uh, Coach Matt came out to me and was like, just get us out of the inning. So I, you know, I just, I, I threw, you know, I was like I said, I got up to like 89 and uh, got out of the inning. But um, I always pitched growing up. Um, like I said, I just, I just blessed with a, with a really good arm. And so little league all the way through high school, um, I pitched. And then, uh, you know, once I got to college, obviously my, my, uh, my future was in the infield. Um, but I always, you know, told coach Prado who was recruited me at Louisville and then coach Mac, like, just let me get on the bump one time, just before I graduate, let me, let me get that light it up a little bit. And then, um, so they did let me. And then when I got to pro ball, same thing, uh, you know, I always told him like, Hey, if we get in the blowout, we need to save arms. Like, I'll throw strikes and, and, you know, I'll, I'll get up there and throw it. So uh, I got the opportunity to do that and I gave up a couple bombs, but you know, it was still fun to get up there and, and, and sling it a little bit. That's great. So, I mean, you had a great career, college career at Louisville and, and, and played obviously very well. Like what are some of the things that you learned? Cause we all learn different things as, as a player. And we want to pass that down to, to the, the next, the, the next upcoming, you know, players, that next crop of players. What's, what are some of the things that, that resonated with you that you learned that you always try to emphasize to players who are, who are coming up, whether you're coaching them right now or maybe in years past. Um, I think the biggest thing I learned was uh, how to be consistent every day uh, in your routine and your preparation. Um, I, I was pretty fortunate uh, at, at Louisville, Chris Burke, who uh, he was from Louisville, played at Tennessee, played in the big leagues with the Astros. Mm-hmm. Um, he used to come out and work out with us every day. And so he was a shortstop. And so I, I spent a lot of time with him and just kind of seeing his you know routine and, and his preparation. And it was just a consistency every day of, of, you know, he, he knew what he wanted to get accomplished and he knew, you know, how to do it uh, at a high level. Um, that helped me a lot, especially in, the, in, in college. Cause uh, you know, when you go into college coming from, I was from Florida here going into Kentucky, it's a new environment. It's, it's a, you know, it's a new setting in terms of the baseball but just being around him um kind of just helped me you know ease into to college baseball pretty quickly and I was able to start as a freshman and um I think it was just because of being with him and kind of just learning like you know he played at Tennessee at a high level and so he had already done the college thing and, and he passed along a lot of the stuff that he did um and, and still did it at the pro level and it just helped me be more consistent and the biggest thing is as a freshman you know it's 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 100 miles an hour and Freshmen usually take a little bit longer um, to develop because they're just not consistent. You know, they, they have tools and they have ability, but it's just that, that the big thing is just being able to, to be the same guy every day. So um, along with, with Chris Burke, I, uh, I used to work out like when I went home with uh, Sean Figgins, um, he's from my high school, he played with my brother. And so him being at the pro level, kind of the same thing um, when I would go home for like, Christmas break and, and even, um, you know, little, little Thanksgiving break, thing like that. Um, both those guys, they're just, their routines were very, the same thing every single day. And it was, you know, 
even if you had a, a good day or a bad day or, or whatever, it, it never changed. So they never really got too high or too low. And I think that's what helped me, um, especially at the college level, is just kind of ease, ease into that, the college side of realizing like, hey, you know, yes, we do a lot of practice, and but but we don't ever have enough time to uh, to to fully get everything in. And you got to be able to be disciplined and have your own routine and, and kind of have your own program so that each day you're making sure that you know you're you're getting the most out of what you can do. Um, you know, with the hours that you get. Yeah, having that routine is so important because it, it eliminates thinking a lot of times, right? You know, day to day, you want to try to control those thoughts as much as possible. Otherwise, they start wandering in places we don't always want them to. Uh, I was reading online about you. And you, it also said that they said, like, you know, what do you want to do after college? And you said you want to work like play or work in Major League Baseball. And so is that something that you thought about after your professional career of, of coaching in, in professional baseball? Or did you want to get into college right away? Or was it how did that all go down? Yeah, so when I uh, I got released from the Twins organization um, in 2012, and wasn't sure I, I wanted to coach. Um, obviously, that time for pro ball is you know they're breaking from spring training, so everything's pretty much set. Um, so my plan was to you know go for the summer and and kind of figure out what my next step was going to be. And uh, my one of my high school coaches, uh, Mike Bell, who's the head coach at Pitt, he uh, I ran into him at a perfect game event. I, I was you know doing the 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 ipad stuff oh, for yeah. a perfect game and you know we we reconnected and you know he asked what i wanted to do and i told him i wanted to coach and um you know he was at florida state at the time and their uh their volunteer matt batulia was leaving and you know he asked if i'd be interested in you know coaching at florida state uh and i was you know absolutely like it just wouldn't even dawned on me that you know my first coaching opportunity would come at such a school that you know like that and so um, that's kind of how I got into the to college baseball. I didn't really know if I wanted to do, you know, college or pro, just depending on, you know, what opportunities I would have. So I just went right into to college and, um, you know, been here since. So I, I, uh, I've had opportunities to go different, different directions. I just think like, you know, unfortunately just the way, um, everything's lined up, it's, it's been meant for me to be in college up to this point. You're currently the director of player development at South Florida, University of South Florida. What what exactly does that role entail? So I think every school is kind of different in how they use um, like those director positions. Uh, for myself, um, it's, you know, it's new to me. Um, it's the first time I haven't been labeled a, you know, a co assistant coach. Um, but I still work with the infielders. I work with base running. So not much so far has changed for me in terms of uh, – you know, what I do at practice and what I do off the field, like in the office setting. Um, I know like some of the things that I can't do is, is coach a base and, and instruct technically in game. But um, you know, that that's, those positions have, you know, evolved so much to where it's, it's kind of like you're basically a, like a bench coach, I would say. Um, and you still have the ability to, to throw BP and hit fungos and, and be around the guys and, you know uh, you know, do uh freight charts and, and scouting reports and plan for opposing teams. So um, up to this point, nothing's really changed in terms of, uh, you know, what I've done in the past. Um, but we'll see when the spring comes kind of, you know, how different, cause I've always been on the basis. So I'm, I'm interested to see how, uh, how it's going to be to be in the dugout. Cause uh, you know, I, I love being on the field and being in the game and um, you know, kind of just right there in the action. So it'll be an adjustment for me, but um, you know, I think it's also, uh, you know, important that you do have that kind of uh, that bench coach uh, mentality and, and realize that in the dugout, there's a lot going on and um, to assist the head coach and be able to kind of, you know, hopefully be a little bit ahead of, uh, of, of what's coming up next, because, um, you know, in game is, is, is so fast paced at times that, you know, sometimes you miss the opportunities to, to pick up, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, something you, you saw in the scouting report that, you know, when you're on the, the bases, it's you know, you're focused on what's going on in the game, whereas in the dugout, now you can actually go through those reports a little bit more and, and kind of be more prepared, I would say. Clearly, you are a very good infielder um, as a player, and I assume that's kind of you, you resonate with with infield. I feel like as coaches, like we you love coaching and everything, but some sometimes you know you, I for myself I more so like I gravitate towards the hitting side like I love everything but I gravitate do you are you that way with infielder and coaching infielders yeah absolutely um you know for me always growing up I, I would rather make a a game-saving play than get the game-winning hit um 
I, I guess just from a, a young age, I was just like the defense to me was just so much fun to watch and so much fun to do because, um, you know, when you're on the field, you know, although you may not be involved in every play, like every pitch, like you have an opportunity to have the ball hit to you and be involved. You know, when you're hitting, you know, when you're up at bat, obviously that's your at bat, but then you, you got eight other guys, you got to wait for it to come back around. So I think just the, uh, the way my mind works is that being on the field for on defense, like, man, I can get the ball at any sing- at any given moment. And um, just that kind of uh, that thought process has always been, uh, I just love being, um, you know, in the infield, especially because that's where I played, but also too, like being the middle infielder, you know, you're, you're, you're a lot of the times the guy communicating with the outfielders, communicating with the catcher and pitcher. So um, just constantly being involved in, and constantly being in communication with all the players is kind of what I think uh, excited me about the infield. Um, and now coaching infield, um, I just think, you know, it's, it's more than just fielding ground balls, obviously, and in, in, in fundamentals, you know, it's it's about thinking and, and basically anticipating plays and trying to predict what's going to happen. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, you, people say the catcher is like the quarterback of the field and whatnot. And I think truly like, you know, everybody could be that on the field and especially in the middle infield, because a lot of times, um, you know, the catchers obviously concerned with the pitcher and, and, and not as concerned with what's going on around the other fielders. So I feel like you can have multiple quarterbacks on the field, especially, you know, through the middle. What's something that you look for when evaluating infielders? And I assume that it's has nothing to do with, with height, right? I mean, I assume, I assume it because, and that's the thing is I think there's, there's recency bias in coaches um, and scouts and everything where they, you see someone who looks the part, and so you naturally gravitate towards them. And I think that can be a slippery slope um, because you're, you're going to miss out on some really good players like yourself, for example. I mean, I mean, perfect example. But just are there some things that you look for, like even just detail oriented? I think one of the, the great things about doing this episode, having you on is, is your knowledge on the infield side. That's not, I mean, I know enough to be dangerous, but I, I don't, I don't have your expertise on that. So I'm kind of relying on people like you um, in terms of what you're looking for. So what are some of the things that you, that stand out to you, if, if anything, or maybe it's just a, a gut gut feeling on a player. Yeah, I think, you know, you're obviously going to watch guys hands and feet and how they work together. Um, you know, big thing for me is the range factor because um, you know, even, Arms not a, a, a deal breaker for me, just because you know you can you can develop arm strength and you can teach guys different things with you know their footwork to to get more on throws. But um, you know it's it's hard to teach range, so to speak, and a lot of that is just feel and, and anticipation. As um, I was saying before, um, it's something that I felt like you know like that I had uh, that allowed me to stay at shortstop, even at you know the size I was. Um, just kind of you know watching guys in between pitches and kind of like where they're moving and, you know, like they read a swing, like a guy fouls the ball off, like, okay, they, you can see that this guy is going to be, you know, be top spinning a ball through the hole. So you see guys kind of move on their own and just watching the in between pitches for me um, is something I like to do because, you know, you go and watch uh, amateur guys uh, play and, you know, in between pitches, some guys are looking out in the stands, kind of, you know, checking out their, some, someone's checking out their swag and, you know, things like that. But then, I like to see those guys who are kind of just locked in on, all right, I just watched that swing or, all right, I know what they're going to throw here or I, you know, I'm anticipating that this is going to happen. And you can kind of see that with, with, with different guys. And I think that's something that's obviously you can't teach. Um, You you can talk about it. I mean, you can talk about it and you can, you can, um, you know, try to get guys to think that way, but ultimately it's, I think it's something that's really hard for guys to, uh, to be taught. Uh, feel you know, so to speak or or instincts um and that's something like I said I I like watching guys in between pitches and in between innings just to see like all right are they just kind of going through the motions or are they really locked in every pitch and um, I think the guys that are you know at the highest level uh, obviously in the big leagues and in some of the top college players in the country they're just locked in on every little detail every single pitch and you can see their feet moving before you know the swings even taken or you can kind of see them gravitate one way or another because they, you know, they, they know what pitch is coming, but they're also, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to predict what's going to happen. And I think those are the the best infielders because again, they're, they're kind of like a step ahead, so to speak. It's, you know, like, you know, 
uh, the NFL starting today and guys like you think of like Tom Brady and like all the, the studying he did and talked about, you know, just being able to, to predict what's going to happen before it happens. Um, and that's a hard thing to, to teach just because, you know, it's, it's an instinct thing and, and you can't, I, I don't think you can teach instincts. Obviously guys have instincts and, and they can get better. Uh, but I think ultimately it's just, it's just something you have or you, or you don't. Well, I think just listening to you right there, one of the things that stood out to me that you'd mentioned is, is, Hey, are guys, you know, locked in on every play? Or are they looking around? Like that's something you can control. You can mm-hmm. control your focus. And so maybe you don't necessarily have those natural instincts, like somebody like, like you had at a young age, but I assume if you're focused and you have self-awareness, you can get better with it over time. But I think Mm -hmm. that focus is, you can't teach that. I mean, you can't, you can't teach somebody who just, who's so hungry to, to want that extra edge. Mm -hmm. Um, What's your take on arm action? Because that's something that I've heard from different um, coaches that it's kind of a deal breaker for them because it's a lot harder to improve that from an infielder standpoint. Yeah. You know, I've learned a lot actually just in the few weeks being with, with our new staff and coach Hannes, um, you know, he has our infielders throw from behind the plate like catchers to, to, to clean some arm action up and to work on quicker releases and things like that. So, um, you know, I, again, it's, it's not a deal breaker for me uh, because I feel like you can, you can clean some of that up um, and watching the guys that we have already uh, in just in a couple of weeks of, of doing that, they're able to, to number one, create more backspin because they're working in their legs more, but also they shorten up their, a lot of their arm action uh, by, just by doing those catcher pops. And, you know, it's fun because they're, they're competing. And so we put them on the clock and, you know, they're, they're trying to compete and they're trying to be the fastest time. So, um, you know, without even really knowing it, they're, they're improving um, their release, their release times and they're improving their feel because, you know, when you're at shortstop or, or third base, your arm action is going to be different than it's going to be behind the plate. Um, and even the first baseman, like watching them, because, you know, first basemen don't ever make enough throws. It's usually rolling a ground ball or, you know, catching it and, and just tossing it back. Um, so watching them being able to do it too, because for me, the first baseman, um, you know, he, he'll throw his throws to second base and in and, and a game, first baseman might not ever make a throw. Uh, you know, he could go a whole weekend without making a throw technically. Um, so I think it's important – you know, to, to make sure first basemans are getting their throws in and just watching the drill um, that Coach Hannes has them do with that is is, is kind of like eye-opening to me. Like, man, like you can you can actually clean up some arm action and, and clean up some release points just by, you know, doing a drill where they're not even realizing they're doing it. They're just competing and it just happens because I always did like quick hands drills down the line and, you know, that'll get some quick releases. But the catching drill has, has been amazing to me because now it's, you know, it's a, it's just a completely different motion that they're used to because they're not catchers and they don't, a lot of them don't have that short arm action that, that catchers are, um, you know, used to having. And I think it's been very beneficial for them uh, to, to kind of be able and kind of like not necessarily change their arm action, but realize, man, I can throw from different, you know, I can throw from different release points and I can get rid of it quicker than I thought. Um, so that's been awesome. And, and I think, again, from the going back to your question, I think arm action for me is is it can be taught. Now, obviously, when they get to this level, they've been doing it for so long, it's harder. But I think with drills where they're, they're not thinking about it, because when you talk to a guy about changing his arm action or trying something different, it, it always looks like awkward. It looks like, you know, and, and sometimes they don't fully believe in it. So it's, you know, they're not fully invested. They're not really trying their hardest or focused as we, as we talked about before. But I think when you mix in those drills where they don't really realize they're, they're doing anything different, I think that really is uh, beneficial. And they start to realize like, man, like I can, I can throw from this angle when I need to, or I can get rid of it from, from here when I need to. Does he have all the infielders do that drill or just or everybody? Yep. Yep. Even the outfielders did it the other day, which was awesome because, you know, uh, and he kind of, uh, you know, simulated that play that it's kind of like that, the ball in the gap that's maybe not a double it's definitely a single and they're going to stretch it and you got to get in and get rid of it so outfielders you know typically you go to a pro style workout they get their their throws and it's i got my time to get my long arm action and over to third and over to home um so just watching them do it too um is is very interesting because you could see guys the first couple times they do it they take their time and you know you tell them their their, their stop time and it's like fellas like that's gotta you gotta you gotta get like under under two one and so 
then they change stuff up and they change arm action and they work on transfers. And all of a sudden, you know, the outfielders handle the baseball is better than the outfield because they're, they're doing something that's, you know, uh, conducive to, to work on it. And it's not just, you know, getting their ground balls in the outfield or just getting fly balls. I like that drill. That's a great one. That's a great one. What do you think about in terms of like developing infielders and things like that, slowing the game down? Cause I think that's something that I remember having Paul Yana, Sean, and, a couple of years ago, I think he's, I believe he's the farm director now of the Tigers. And one of the things he had said was, you know, the enemy of an infielder is anxiety. Mm-hmm. He's like, anytime I felt anxiety, like that, that was, that, that was the worst thing possible. And so for slowing the game down, I think you mentioned that a little bit earlier, is there certain things that, that you've seen work for players, whether that be right after they made an error, whether that be just, you know, hey, big crowd or scouts coming to watch you or whatever that is, or is, is there anything that you've seen work not maybe for you or for others as well? Yeah. So I like doing a lot of rhythm and pace stuff um, to, to understand how fast you have to play or how slow you can play. Um, first thing I usually do when I get infielders is I bring out stopwatch and, you know, we'll talk about what's an average time down to first base. Um, you know, and most guys, like I usually tell them it's about, let's say four, three for a, uh, a college player. And so I'll sit or I'll be there with all the infielders and I'll pick on one guy and say, all right, tell me when to stop when you think it's 4.3 seconds and I'll start my watch. And we're just standing there. And, you know, they always, they're like three, eight, three, seven, three, five. So it's, it's always really fast. And I said, so see your mind right now is working way too fast because I put you on the spot. I go, and we're just standing here. You're already thinking way too fast and your mind sped up. I said, this is why we have to learn how to play at certain pace, different paces so that when we get in the game and that crowd you're talking about or those scouts are out there, I can slow myself down just by in my head knowing like, okay, I don't have to rush. I, I know my, my time, my internal clock is telling me that I got time and I can just, you know, relax and make the play. So I do a lot of different like, uh, you know, clock stuff. So I'll, I'll have them match the clock. So I might say, all right, it's a, it's a four, two runner. You got to try to get it there uh, to first base at four, two, or as close as four, two as possible, or four, five, or three, nine, just, just to get that different pace. So they know what pace they can play at. Then we'll do where you got to beat the clock where I tell them it's, you know, three, eight, and they just have to rush through it. And then, you know, they realize, man, that like sometimes they'll get it there like three, four, like, Oh man, I actually had more time than I thought. Um, so I like doing a lot of different uh, things on the on the stopwatch so that they learn how to play at different paces. And then when we get in the game, um, I usually just hold up a color for for like a time reference, and then they kind of know each guy's different um, to how what pace they can play at, and maybe how many shuffles they can get in, or how many you know if they need to come get the ball um, a little bit more aggressively or not. Um, so for me, I think it's just about making them realize, like right and right and seeing the clock and understanding how much time they actually have versus you know constantly just telling a guy hey he's a he's a quick runner well what does that mean because i mean you know guys are quick but they're not always fast like my example for would be me i ran a 60 and on a good day maybe six nine seven oh which is you know pretty average but i would get down the line you know anywhere from like four two or so so like i was quick to first base but I wasn't necessarily considered a fast runner. So if you go by that, you know, guys would think, oh, he's probably an average runner. But then all of a sudden I hit a ground ball and it looks faster than it actually is because I get to the first base quicker. So I I try to constantly do a lot of internal clock plays, uh, just rhythm and pace so that the guys can, you know, learn themselves on what pace they need to play at. Because it's, it's, to me, it's easy to to tell guys like we got to play at this speed. Uh, You know, we got to play at, uh, you know, aggressive at this speed all the time. But guys are different shapes and sizes. Um, you know, you, you guys like like myself, like if you watch me play, I was obviously no pun intended, but I'm low to the ground because I'm short. But like my strides were quick and short versus, you know, a guy like who played next to me at third base, Chris Dominguez, he's 6'4", 250. He's got long, you know, slower strides, but we still cover the same ground because his strides are bigger um, and longer. So it was just understanding, all right, what's my internal clock telling me on a guy that's a green runner, so to speak, or, or a four, two runner. Like I know what pace I have to play at 
but the guy next to me might have to play at a different pace just because of the fact that, you know, we're just, we're just different sizes. We're, we're different arm actions. We're, uh, we're, we're different in, you know, whether we funnel or push through. Cause I don't, I don't teach one way or another about funneling or push through. I, I want guys to be athletes. I want them to, to, you know, play the way that, that they feel comfortable playing because if they try to do something that maybe they're, they're not comfortable doing, it's probably going to lead to errors because as you said, that anxiety is going to come in now, like, Oh, did I funnel correctly? Or did I separate correctly? And then all of a sudden, you know, they make an error just because they're overthinking and not just, you know, not just making the routine play that they make every day. Some really good points in there. Really good points. I love your, your system when it comes to the different clocks and how, you know, you, you, you play around with it so they can understand, you know, what type of runner it is and what that means for them personally, because if they practice it and they know what their own rhythm needs to be, I think that's, that's really good stuff right there. W what about when you're going back to when you're watching infielders again, do you, do you think more infielders need to focus more on something defensively in terms of like backhand, um, right at them, slow roller, so slow rollers, or more so, you know, you see, you don't see enough infielders working on their arm and they need to be throwing more. Like, what would you say for, for high school players out there? Like what should they be doing more of that? You don't think that they are, are putting in, in high enough demand for themselves. Um, I would say first their angles. I feel like, you know, if you, well, a lot of times you watch high school guys, um, they're kind of, a lot of times they're in between, with with how the hop is so they they you know quote get an in-between hop but it's because their angle to the ball was not correct um like you know we play on turf so it's really hard to get caught in between unless your angle is bad or you get it you know you you obviously don't read the hop off the bat very well but i think like especially from the watching the high school they want to be so aggressive and come like straight to the ball instead of creating in that angle to where i get a nice clean hop that i can just you know get in and out of my glove with a clean transfer. So um, for me, I think it's a lot of guys there. They try to time the ball to the spot instead of beat the ball to the spot. So then I can have some adjustability to where like, Oh man, you know what? I'm going to get in between hop, but I can go get that short hop versus, you know, like watching guys when they first come to typically to into college. Um, I always talk about beat the ball to the spot because they try to time it. Yeah. You know, like it, it's a, it's a mechanism. I think that you see, especially when you're rolling balls in between innings, like, you know, for example, a guy's knows there's no runner. He knows he's got time. So a lot of times they get lazy with their feet because there's no pressure and there's no internal clock. There's no, uh, there's no threat uh, going to first base. And then all of a sudden the game happens and guys get caught in between hops because it's simply their angle to the ball is, you know, the it is either straight in at it or, oh, this ball's to my backhand. So let me just get all the way over, cross over, whatever you want to, whatever uh, the footwork telling him. And then all of a sudden, oh man, that ball's not hit hard enough. Now I got to come through it. And I've, I'm going to a backhand when I could have actually just fronted the ball and got into my legs easier and got my momentum going towards first faster. So for me, I think I would just say angles just because I think a lot of guys, when the ball's hit, they automatically assume like, okay, this is the play versus having some adjustability and realizing like, you know, a ball that's a, a routine ground ball, I could still one hand that and get a better hop than just waiting on the two hand, um, you know, funnel play because it's hit medium speed. It's a, it's a routine ground ball. You watch guys in the big leagues all the time. I mean, they one hand balls a lot. They uh, obviously they, they are on a different level in terms of the speed of the game. Um, most guys don't run hard at the big league level. So, you know, they, they have plenty of time and obviously they have much more arm strength, but if you watch like BP and watch guys take ground balls, they're constantly working on angles. And at least from what I've seen, the guys in the big leagues are constantly working on, you know, getting the right angle on every single ground, on every single fungo they hit. And you can see when the coach hits the fungo, they're already the first hop. It's like, they're so good at like, okay, that's going to be this angle. And they're, they're rarely ever caught in between the big leagues. Um, you know, you watch big league games, you don't see many errors in the infield in terms of being like caught in between. Now, if they get, you know, a top spin bullet hit at them, you know, they try to pick through it or something happens. But typically those guys are never caught in between, uh, like in between hops. And it's just because their angles are so good and their first step and, and the ability to recognize the hop after, you know, initial contact is just like through the roof. Who's your favorite infielder to watch right now? Uh, right now, I mean, I like watching Trey Turner just because he's 
I mean, he's just, he's got so much range and he's got so much ability. Um, you know, it's funny that he was at one time he was a center fielder, uh, you know, they got moved back in the infield. Cause, uh, when I was at Florida state, he, he played short at NC state. Um, and he was fun to watch then. Uh, but I think like guys like him, even Mookie Betts, I mean, I just get fascinated on those guys that can go to the outfield and then come into the infield, come back in the infield and just like, basically be almost gold glove guys that can just do it at high level. Um, you know, especially like the shortstop, you know, Mookie Betts, you know, goes out for right field for how many years and then just comes back in one day. He's at second, one day he's a short, then he goes back out to right and center. Like, I think that's amazing. And uh, growing up uh, more of that era that I watched would have been like Sean Figgins, for example, the guy, like I mentioned before, you know, he played second, third, and then he'd go out and center and play. Um, ben Zobris, you know, play short, second, third, go out in the outfield. So, I would say like those types of guys, I really uh, enjoy watching just because, you know, they're not in the infield every day. They're in the outfield someday. So they don't get the same amount of, uh, you know, of work in the infield per se that the everyday infielders do. And for them to be able to go out there and, and play the outfield at a high level and still come back in and play the infield. I mean, that's, to me, that's just amazing. Cause uh, my, uh, one of my years in, in pro ball, they had me go to the outfield a little bit and, I mean, I went out there and I was lost. I was like, man, I've never done this. And the ball spins the way it does. And, uh, you know, I never forget, uh, I was playing left field and the guy hit a line drive that I thought was going to, I was going to come in and dive and it went like 10 feet over my head. And I was like, man, like, how do you guys do this down here? Like, this is, this is tougher than I thought. Cause you know, you think outfield, oh, just catching a fly ball. But, um, you know, I, I learned a lot of respect for those guys uh, when I went out there and, um, you know, then coming back into the infield, I felt like, man, like I, I definitely don't want to go back out there. So, um so just those guys, like, you know, like I said, like Trey Turner and, and Sean Figgins and Zobrist and uh, being able and Mookie just to, I mean, I think that those guys are so much fun to watch because like I said, they, just, they, just, they can do it all. And uh, they, they don't seem to miss a beat when they come back in the infield. Um, you'd never guess and say that guy, oh, that's an outfielder playing the infield. You know, like you can, you could see that when, when you have guys come in and we always have outfielders say, oh, coach, I, I used to play infield. And they come in and like, yeah, well, th that's why you're in the outfield now because it, it looks like that. But <laughs> That's great. Yeah, there's 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 no lonelier run than the run that you have to make as an outfielder after you misplayed a ball and it, and it, it actually went over your head while you're going in. That's a very lonely run. Uh, Chris, this has been a ton of fun, man. I, I know you're you're busy at work uh, today. You got you know stuff going on at, at South Florida, so I appreciate you coming on and appreciate uh, uh, Tyler Packnick for introducing us. Uh, so thanks again, man. This has been great. I've learned a lot, um, and we'll have to we'll have to get together in person sometime. Absolutely. Again, thank you for having me on, and I look forward to the next time we talk.